Hey friends, welcome to this week's moment with Miranda. I am so glad that you've chosen to share one of the moments of your life with me. So thank you so much. I feel honored for you joining me this evening. One of my favorite movie trilogies when I was growing up was the series Back to the Future. And if you know those movies, you know that it's all about this young guy named Marty McFly who begins to travel back to the past in order to change the future. It's this whole series of going back in order to move forward and it's based on the I should have this or I could have that and then things would have changed in my life. And if you know the movies, the end of the series concludes with Doc Brown making this statement. He says, whatever your future is, make it a good one. Have you ever looked at your life and thought, wow, how in the world did I end up here? Maybe pleased with your present circumstances. Or maybe you've said, how in the world did I end up here? Looking at where you are now and regretting some of the things of the past, the decisions that you've made and the choices that you've made. I should have done this or if I would have done that. What kind of a future do I have now? Well, friend, if that's you, then this moment is for you tonight because I want to encourage you that no matter what, if you're thrilled with where you find yourself right now, or maybe you're full of regret and you're looking at your life and thinking, if I would have done that differently or could have done that better, maybe I would be in a different place. Maybe you're wondering if God's heart and his plan has changed toward you. I want you to know today that your future has not changed, that there's still one for you, that God still has a plan. And the truth is, is he saw it all from the very beginning. He saw your future and he saw your past and he still said yes to you and to your life. So today, don't look back in order to change the past because you can't. And don't look back to see where God left you because, friend, he hasn't left you. If you're going to look back at all, why don't you look back for the future? Because the same yes that was given to you way back then is the same yes that God is declaring over your life today. So welcome tonight to this moment with Miranda. Welcome into the house of a delighted father. Welcome to his table where there's room for you. I think today he wants to take a little trip down memory lane and remind you of who he is in your life and remind you of who you are to him. So welcome to this place where we get to believe it, speak it, and see it. We believe the words that God says about us. We speak those words over our lives and we see them transform us into his image from glory to glory. So welcome again to this week's moment with Miranda. I really am so glad that you've chosen to take it with me today. You know, I had a really cool experience earlier this week. I was reminded of something that happened to me back when I began, I'll call it my faith journey when I was 18 years old. You know, it was one of those times when I was at a conference at a church, we were out in California, and it was one of those services where the Spirit of God was just moving, and I was so inspired to be anything and give anything that God would ask of me to be or to give. You know what that's like, and you know my story of one where I was just a young girl with this genuine heart that wanted to follow God and to do everything right and to do everything that He asked of me. So throughout this conference, I had been giving offerings, and eventually I came to the place where I literally had no money left. I didn't even have change left in my purse. And I'm up the altar and I am just moved by the goodness of God. And there's an offering being taken and I'm thinking, I don't have anything to give and I need to give something. What do, what do I do? What do I do? And I was reminded of these stories I heard of different ones giving jewelry when they had nothing else to give. And so I looked down at my hand 
and on my hand I had two rings that had been given to me. Now those rings really had very little monetary value. They were they were probably 14 karat gold, but you know it wasn't going to be this big extravagant amount of money that would have been gotten for them. But their value wasn't in their money. The value was in their personal worth to me, because those rings were a gift from my parents. One for my 16th birthday, and the other ring was given to me by my dad right after I graduated from high school, literally just a few days before I began traveling full time in ministry. So their value was in who had given them to me and the heart with which they they were given, not actually in the value of the rings themselves. And I remember going back and forth through my mind, do I give these rings? Do I not give these rings? These are from my parents. You know how it goes. You know what it's like when you kind of feel like you're supposed to do something. And so as I'm standing there at the altar having this inner dia dialogue, I heard Heard another voice that said am I not worth those rings and you know I could never say to the Lord God you're not worth it who would say that who who had a genuine heart that wanted to serve God could ever tell the Lord no I'm not going to give that and at the time acting on what I knew, you know, God was a God that was happy with sacrifice. And I believed that it was my sacrifice that would move God's hand to do something on my behalf. So I responded to the need to sacrifice in order to make a point to God. Friend, I know now something different. You know, I know more that, yes, God is pleased with our sacrifices that are given to him in faith. But it's not the sacrifice that moves God. It's the heart from which that sacrifice is given. It's the heart that moves God. And there's a huge difference between that. And it's unfortunate that so many of us have lived with the mentality for years that if I give just a little more, then God's going to do this. Or if I sacrifice that too, or I push a little bit harder, or I try a little bit harder, then I can prove to God that I'm serious about serving him and that I'm worthy of his blessing and him moving and working on my behalf. You know, these were things that I believed and they were not taught to me intentionally that way, but that's how I heard them and that's how I formulated a lot of my thinking. Instead of starting from a position in Christ of being blessed and already having everything that I would need for life and for godliness, your religion told me that I lacked these essential things and that I had to sacrifice to God in order to prove that somehow I was worthy of them. And this kept me striving for years to achieve what I already was able to receive through Christ if I just knew, if I only knew that I had already received it through him. So here I was as this 18-year-old girl, genuine in faith and genuine in desire to serve and to do something for the Lord. And I felt him say, am I not worth those rings? And, and I responded to what I knew and I said, God, of course you're worth it. So I remember taking those rings off and laying them at the altar and just saying, you can have them, Lord. Well, long story short, the Tharp family, who I was traveling with, they found out about those rings that night and they gave an offering in place of my sacrifice for those rings. And they took them and they tucked them away. And I don't remember if it was my next birthday or when exactly which birthday it was, but I do remember that I got a box from them on my birthday. And when I opened that box, there were the rings that my parents had given me, one for my birthday and one for my graduation. And you know what? They were symbols of covenant love from my family. And the amazing thing was, was that God had given them back to me. Friends, there's so much 
oh, so much that I see, you know, in that exchange. And I admit for years, I saw that as God responding to my sacrifice because I was willing to give anything of great personal value that that's why he blessed me because I was doing the right thing that that's why he blessed me. And that's why I was worthy of him moving me forward into all that he had for me. And the thing with this thinking was that it became a measuring stick for me. Great personal sacrifice became the measuring stick by which I lived. If it was valuable to me, if it was something that I really wanted, if it was something that was a desire of mine, then it had to be sacrificed for God so that I could prove that I was worthy and that I was committed to him and that I was worth it because my service became all about my sacrifice and my future became all about my sacrifice. And the problem with that thinking is that if you come to the place where you don't feel like you're sacrificing enough, then you're not sure that your future is secure. You're not sure that God will still do for you what he did if you sacrificed or not. And look, I am not saying that we don't sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. The truth is, is as we follow Christ, there are times when we give up things that we really would have rather had, or we set things aside for a season, or sometimes it's not convenient, the things that he asks of us to do. You know, that's just discipleship. That's just following Jesus. But what I really want to focus on is this, that what was it that caused God to respond to my offering? Was it the sacrifice or was it the heart in which it was given? Was it my obedience to him or like those rings that were covenant symbols for my family? Was it my covenant with him that caused him to respond? You see, friends, it's a hugely different thing. Covenant is such a deeply personal and a holy thing. I, I'm just exploring covenant in such a greater way, you know, in my own personal life and in my own journey. And I believe that it's something that many of us don't fully understand because so many of us are living as contract Christians. We're living in these contract commitments rather than living in the covenant love of God. And there is such a difference between covenant love and a contract commitment. And I, like I said, this is something that I'm growing in, but what I am finding out is that covenant love is based on promise, not on compulsion. A covenant love is based on willingness, not obligation to somebody or something. It, in a covenant, when one party is not able to fulfill their part, the other party takes it upon themselves to fulfill it. They pick up the slack where the other person is not able to hold up their end of the deal. The deal. And But here's the thing with covenant love is that it's entirely up to the other party if they want to live in the covenant or to walk away. And this is huge because true covenant love will never force or coerce the other party to stay. They will never use, covenant love will never use fear or intimidation to get you to respond how they want you to respond and in a way that they want you to respond. In covenant love, if you don't want to stay, you don't have to stay. Because covenant is not legally binding. Covenant goes beyond a legal obligation. Covenant is heart entwining. And when two hearts are made one, when they're made one in mind and in purpose and in intention, how can they ever be divided? This is a marker of covenant love. If you want to know what covenant love looks like, it's whenever you're in one mind, in one heart, in one intention, moving toward one purpose. And the fruit of covenant love produces joy and it produces freedom. 
But the fruit of a contract commitment produces work and it produces obligation. Now, I know that some of this is deep, but I'm really praying that the Holy Spirit would help to bring light and to bring truth to what I'm sharing with you tonight. And I see in the scripture a really perfect example of this, and it's found in the book of Galatians. And it's where the Apostle Paul is talking to the Gentile believers at the church at Galatia. And they are being told by these Jews that have come in that in order for them to maintain their covenant with God, that what they have just come into, that they have to now begin to be circumcised that they have to start fulfilling some of the obligations of the old covenant in order to maintain their righteousness, in order to prove that they are truly followers of Christ. And I can hear Paul's righteous indignation as he begins to say, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two wives, two sons, one by a bondwoman who was Hagar, and the other by a free woman who was Sarah. He that was born of the slave was born after the flesh or by self-effort, but he that was born of the free woman was by promise or by covenant. See, I don't want to get frank here, but I'm going to get frank anyway because that's how I'm going to be. You know, Hagar was an Egyptian slave. She was given to Abraham in order to have sex so that they could have a baby. This was Hagar's purpose. She didn't have a choice because she was under the bondage of slavery. She had been taken out of Egypt and she was under another person's ownership. She became a contract commitment because of legal obligation. Abraham was legally obligated to give Ishmael an inheritance because Hagar had fulfilled her obligation to give him a child. In the end, she had his baby, and therefore there was a contract that tied Abraham to her. This was not God's perfect plan because God's plan was not contract commitment. God's plan was covenant love. And we can see how this worked with Ishmael. And I think it's interesting that whenever we look at Ishmael's name, his name means God will hear. And Hagar cried out. She said, God hears me in my affliction. I want us to notice that, yes, there was fruit from the contract of Abraham and of Hagar, but it was a fruit that came out of affliction, and it was a fruit that had to be maintained by obligation. It had to be maintained because it was a contract. It's just like the law. The law was a contract that had to be maintained by man's obligation to it. But what about Sarah? You see, we read that Sarah was the wife of covenant, that she was the one that was there, united with Abraham of one mind, of one purpose, of one intention. When God called Abraham out of Ur and he said, come out of the land that you have been in, come out and I'll show you a land that I'm going to bring you to. And I'm going to make your name great. And I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to make nations of you. You see, Sarah was the wife of covenant. The covenant was not just given to Abraham. The covenant was made with Sarah as well. It was her womb that was going to bring forth the covenant seed. It was all about covenant with Sarah, not contract and the fruit of that union was a boy named Isaac which means laughter so think about it the fruit that came from a covenant a covenant union was one of joy and it was one of freedom you see sacrifice it was about the heart of Abraham that he intended to give that sacrifice by faith. Abraham believed in the covenant making, covenant keeping God, and he believed that that God had made a covenant with he himself. 
Friends, this is what God did for you. Something that couldn't actually take place. You see, this was a contract that produced endless work and endless obligation in this continual sense of affliction because the scripture tells us this old covenant could never make the ones who came to it perfect. It could never make those ones perfect pertaining to conscience. This is why Hebrews says that God found fault with the first covenant and so he established a second covenant that would be made on better promises by a better sacrifice you and I are never able to make a perfect enough good enough sacrifice in order to get God to be pleased with us so that we can be made righteous in his sight God is not interested in you and I keeping a contract commitment with himself he's interested in covenant love that he has made you with you and I together in any sacrifice that comes about as a result of that covenant love is not a sacrifice that is meant to force God's hand it moves his heart because his heart is a heart of love because covenant sacrifice comes from the heart it was his idea he tells us in john 3:16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but that all would come to repentance that they would have everlasting life You see, covenant that is born from the heart will transform the heart. And it produces the fruits of righteousness, of peace, of joy, and of freedom. That is what covenant does for you and I. So maybe you're asking, what does that have to do with your rings, Miranda? And what does that have to do with where I am right now and going back for the future? You see, friends, when I look back at my experience with the rings, in the past, I would have thought that it was my sacrifice that moved God's heart. And so therefore, I would think, what else of great personal desire must I sacrifice in order to prove to God that I'm serious? You know, I lived under that thing that when you have nothing left, That that is when God is truly pleased with you and he blesses you because he's obligated. But friends, that's just not the truth of how God actually works. I know now that God never intended for me to give a sacrifice in order to move his heart. He He wasn't impressed with my sacrifice. What he was impressed with and what he saw was my genuine heart. He knew the genuine heart of this 18 year old girl who didn't understand much of anything except that she wanted to do something for the Lord. And you see what I didn't know is that God had already accepted me, that I didn't have to work for that accepting. He already said yes to me. He already said yes to my future. He had already seen all of the path of my life and he still said yes because his yes was a covenant yes. His love was a covenant love. It was established on covenant sacrifice made by Jesus Christ even though I didn't understand it yet. Friends, from the beginning of time, it has been in God's heart to bless us. He wants to live in covenant with us. It's his pleasure to join himself to you and I. And he made that possible through Jesus Christ for any who would say yes to him. When we give our yes to him, I'm telling you, he gives his yes to us. And it is a yes that is signed and sealed for 
in the blood of Jesus Christ. We are accepted through that sacrifice. And it was that perfect sacrifice that brought in the new covenant where now I live in the blessing of God. I live in the favor of God. I have all that I need in Christ so I can rest. I'm anointed. I am holy. I have a future. I have peace, joy, righteousness. Jeez, that sounds like I'm living in the kingdom of God right now. And you know what? He holds me in that covenant. And if he asks for me to make a sacrifice, I do so in faith, just like how I started off in faith, believing that he is good and that he's faithful to perform his word. Friends, when I look back to that covenant, I can look forward to the future, to all that God has in store for me. So in this moment today, my friends, are you looking back and feeling regret? Are you looking at your present his mind about me? Are you looking back and are you questioning if you've done enough or if you've done it right in order to move God's hands for you? Friend, I want to tell you that you can stop looking back and judging your future based upon your past. If you're going to look back, then friend, I want you to look back for the sake of the future. Look back to the covenant that God made with you in the very beginning through your belief in Jesus Christ. That covenant has not changed. That God has not changed. And his yes to you is the same yes that he says now. So why don't you start there? And for the sake of the future, move forward into all that God has for you today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that we truly can look forward to what you have for us. That where you started us, that yes, in Christ Jesus has accomplished everything that we need for life and for godliness. It is that covenant of love that has established us in your house. It's from that place of security that I get to live and I move and I have my being. It's from that place that I don't have to work for you. I work with you and I flow in your spirit and I walk with you and you are delighted to join yourself to me. And it's from that covenant that if there are times when I come short, that your covenant is still there holding up its end of the deal, that it truly is my choice if I walk away from that covenant. But in any moment, I can turn back and say, Father, is that covenant still there? And you say, yes, that covenant has never changed. So, Father, I ask that you would truly teach us how great your covenant is with us through Jesus Christ. That it is signed, it is sealed, and it is ours every single day of our lives. Thank you so much for that promise, that we can look to the future, that we can go back for the sake of the future and move forward in covenant. Thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Friends, thank you so much for joining me for this moment with Miranda. I, if I went out for a little bit, I'm sorry. I hope that it tuned back in. But I thank you so much for taking these few moments of your life to join me in believing it and speaking it and seeing it. Believing what God says, speaking it over our lives, and seeing it transform us into his same image from glory to glory. I hope you'll join me again for another moment with Miranda. God bless you guys so very much.